Uh, I could introduce uh, each of them, um, but we have a limited amount of time. And so that we don't do terribly flowery introductions, uh, they'll all be modest and introduce themselves. Uh, Scott, why don't we start with you? All right. Scott Altman, call sign Scooter. I was the uh, theoretical commander of the mission, uh, <laughs> Test TS 125. Uh, Greg Johnson, Greg C. Johnson, because there's two of them. Uh, call sign Ray J. I was uh, Scooter's pilot and uh, looked after Atlantis on the mission. Uh, Megan MacArthur, and I was the flight engineer and robotic arm operator on the mission. And a brand new mom, by the way. <laughs> brand new mom. It was either going to be me moderating or Theo. He's only six months old, so they landed on me. Mike? Hi, I'm Mike Good, uh, call sign Bueno. And I was a mission specialist. I got to sit next to Megan on the uh, flight deck going uphill. And then I got to go outside and do a couple of spacewalks with uh, Mike Massimino. I'm John Grunsfeld. I was the EV-1 lead spacewalker. This was my third Hubble mission. And I was paired up with Drew Feustel, who couldn't make it tonight, uh, for three of the spacewalks. Uh, Mike Massimino, one of the spacewalkers. As uh, Mike mentioned, he and I were one of the spacewalking teams on the mission. Yeah, I should mention, uh, I, I don't know how much knowledge you all have of STS-125, but just very briefly, uh, to remember it as a journalist. Uh, the Columbia disaster occurred in 2000. Three, three, three. And as you remember, there was an extensive uh, investigation, an accident board that came back, and there was so much concern about the heat shields. And uh, as you may remember, every mission <coughs> after that, save one, uh, went to the International Space Station because at the space station, you could flip the shuttle, you could look at it, you could test to the fact that all of the heat shields were uh, in place in good shape, that reentry. Uh, which was so tragically, um, uh, so tragically occurred uh, with the Columbia disaster could be uh, nominal that the shuttle could come back. That was not possible uh, with a Hubble repair mission. And Hubble um, uh, was, I think I heard one of you say, was operating at about 20% capacity after uh, the number of years that would have been up there at that point, uh, 20 years yeah. uh, by the time you guys went up. And um, so for a while, the Hubble mission, the Hubble repair mission, was scrapped because it was problematic as to how uh, they could be certain that the heat shields had come through launch in good shape and that uh, reentry would be uh, possible. Um, and that was very tricky. Uh, the administrator of NASA at first canceled the mission. Uh, there was some, as I recall, a discussion about whether a robotic uh, mission could be sent up to do uh, perhaps what uh, they would want humans to do. Uh, that became impractical. And finally, uh, when a new administration came in and an administrator named uh, Griffin took over NASA, he reinstituted uh, the mission and 125 took place. Later than had been anticipated, it was supposed to go in late 2008, went in 2009, and there was a way uh, to look at the, at the heat shields. Mm -hmm. uh, how was it done? Well, we had to basically invent a boom inspection system. Uh, they needed it for the other missions, too, but we were the only mission that used it to completely inspect the shuttle, and we shoehorned it into flight day two so that Megan could uh, use the arm on that day, and instead of having a day to figure out what space flight is like, we spent it doing inspections of the vehicle with uh, teams of three to four of us kind of rotating through while we did the inspection. So basically, I'm here as a supernumerary uh, because I've, you know, I've spent the last hour with these folks. And believe me, they talk to each other uh, much more interestingly than they would answer uh, questions. So I'm, I'm basically here to say, go. Uh, but I will start it out by, uh, by saying, Mike, I, downstairs, um, I heard you being interviewed by somebody from, I think, NASA television. And I heard you talk movingly about the first time that you emerged uh, into the payload bay, the beginning of your first spacewalk. And I think every one of us wonder, if I was a young junior astronaut and I was coming into the program, I would say to you guys, what's it like? Uh, it is something that I think every one of us here has imagined in our own mind. Um, but I would suspect it is terribly hard to convey to people the majesty of what it is that you go through. You're working all the time, 
But there's got to be a moment or two when you just think, holy cow, this is unbelievable. And you described it rather movingly as you came into the payload bay for the first time. You're right, Charlie. The first, uh, so this was my first space flight and my first space walk. And so um, you're right, the, most of the time, your focus is two or three feet in front of your face, and you're just working, you're working on the telescope. Our, our, our nose was literally inside the telescope. Um, but as I came out the airlock that first time, and I followed Mike out, Mike was already outside, and I came out for the first time, and I'm sort of coming out on my back, although there's no up or down in space, but that's just sort of the orientation. And as I came out and I put my first hand on that handrail outside the airlock, and I looked up out through the payload bay doors and back at the Earth. So the Earth was above me, and I saw it for the first time from that perspective. And um, from up there, you can tell it's a planet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could see the, the horizon, the whole horizon. You can uh, see this thin blue atmosphere around it, and it's just incredibly beautiful. And it just, it froze me in my tracks. And, you know, we're all, we not, all know it's going to be a long spacewalk. We got a lot of work to do. We're in a hurry. But I was just frozen there in time. And uh, I was looking up at the Earth and just blown away by the, the beauty and just the, it all just sort of hit me right then. You know, we had practiced so much in the pool. And there's all these divers all over the place. There's bubbles everywhere. You can see the, you know, you can see the bottom of the pool. The difference up there is uh, we were by ourselves. And it was... Uh, you just look out into the black, blackness of space. And for the first time, you're not looking through a window. That's right. You're actually seeing it really in, in high def, <laughs> yeah. I guess yeah. is the way. Everything's a 3D high def out there, <laughs> yeah. looking through the visor. John, one of the interesting things, because it was a problematic mission, there was uncertainty about it, they took astronauts with experience who had been there before. Mike was saying it was his first, but it was your third time to the Hubble. Mass, it was your third time. Second time. Second time. And, and it was My your second third time. Second time. Fourth flight, second time to Hubble. Right. Um, so they wanted experience knowing what were the pitfalls of the mission. What was really in, foremost in your mind um, in terms of, of accomplishing the mission? Well, for me, it was uh, coming back the third time uh, was you know, more than a privilege, especially since when the mission was canceled. I was at that time the NASA chief scientist. So I was in the middle of that. Uh, and when we invented the Hubble robotic servicing mission, you know, I thought, okay, maybe this is how we're going to get back to Hubble. And in fact, there's people in the audience here who were prime on trying to make that happen. And had we not done the robotic servicing mission, there wouldn't have been a final servicing mission. It kept the team alive, building in, uh, tools and techniques that we ended up actually using. Uh, but over the course of the first two Hubble service emissions, I developed uh, kind of a checklist of the top 10 things that you need to worry about. That by the time we got ready, had 34 items on it. <laughs> <laughs> and and number, number one was be safe. OK, that always has to be the number one. Number two was don't break the Hubble. <laughs> and so as, as we started training together, of course, uh, Scooter and Mass had been uh, we'd been a team on the 2002 mission, so they were already indoctrinated. Um, but it was, you know, for us as a team, learning, you know, the, learning the Hubble Space Telescope for folks who hadn't really been exposed to it before, how important the Hubble is. Uh, you know, there's sort of a corollary: don't break the, you know, pick your number eight billion dollar space telescope, or you know, precious telescope, yeah. irreplaceable. But, um, but there are just hundreds of little things that are unique to the Hubble. That are, you know, we don't have a knowledge base from the International Space Station, and you know, we learned all of these things from, you know, from each other. You know, Mass and I having been to Hubble, but also from the the team, from our spacewalking instructors who had worked the previous missions. Uh, Hubble is is sort of a heritage, if you will, of people who have worked on it their whole lifetimes. That's one of the parts of the story that makes it so remarkable, uh, is the knowledge base. And you know, we're celebrating the 25th, and you know, we were up there in almost 20 years. And so we got to work with and meet these folks who are walking Hubble encyclopedias. Well, one of the things I think, uh, I, I went over a little history of the mission. But when you see the exhibit, which is um, here on the Intrepid, 
uh, it reminds you that at the beginning, Hubble was a failure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was just noticing that I remember the Newsweek cover that said uh, NASA's one and a half billion dollar fiasco. Um, remind us why it was a failure, uh, how critical was the, was the degree of problem that you had. It was very, very small. How that was fixed um, and what shape it was in when you guys got there. You want to handle that? Uh, right there? Yeah, I'll handle it. Well, you know the, um, so it's kind of interesting. In 1990, they, uh, they launched, and uh, the mirror was not ground perfectly. Uh, uh, the surface wasn't perfect. It was about a 50th of the width of a hair off. But that was just enough to make it out of focus. That's what happens when you go to lens crafters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, you know, a 2.4 meter sized mirror, so it's a pretty good sized mirror. Um, and what I think was more amazing is uh, how we recovered as quickly as we did. And so in 1993, when we put in CoStar, which is the corrective optics, uh, how quickly it recovered and then uh, how magnificent Hubble turned out in, in its pictures. So uh, it, was, it was looking bad initially. Um, I joined, personally joined NASA the day after it launched. Um, and, uh, and then I heard this whole story, and then... Uh, so you're saying it wasn't your fault. I, <laughs> I didn't ground yeah, I think he's admitting to something right now. <laughs> that, was, that was a CYA uh, yeah. comment there from, from, from Ray J. It's a great story. It's just an absolute <laughs> great story of science and technology and people working on this team. I see a lot of players out in the audience who um, helped this whole mission and pulled it all off, and uh, we're forever indebted to them. And what shape was it in when you guys got there? Why was 125 so critical that they were willing to take the inherent risk? Yeah, maybe, John, you can talk to it, but it was certainly a quarter of what it, it should have been. And uh, we, had, we had a mission so planned so tightly. In fact, the, uh, the current administrator of NASA was a consultant who was looking to make sure that we didn't go oversubscribed on the mission. And uh, he was himself a pilot on a Hubble mission. The deploy. Yeah, the deploy he mission. Deploy. So uh, he was making sure that this mission wasn't so tight that we, uh, you know, we'd overdo it. And, and Mass, you ran into problems. There were yeah, big we, problems. We, we, you, you saved that question for me. <laughs> there were problems, the guy on Well, you, yeah, had, to, you had to solve some of them. We did, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, down in the, the, the water tank, um, a part of the exhibit downstairs shows us working in the tank and one of the good things about doing that training down there is you get to practice rehearse your spacewalks from start to finish and you make mistakes in the water and you kind of write those down and you, and you, you say oh well this won't happen to us in flight and usually it doesn't but then there's always it always felt like there was that group of, the, of problems that you might not get to and experience during training and we had a couple right from the start pretty much um, with the telescope, you guys are out there. John and Drew is not here, so we can blame everything on Drew. <laughs> it, it, it's, well, he was he holding the wrench. He was holding. We can really blame this one on him. So the wide field camera, which was going to do what, John? What was the wide field going to do? Unravel the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> Unravel the mysteries of the universe. That was the actual definition we got. John can explain. It's actually the part real. of the name. It's, it's the wide field camera will unravel the mysteries of the universe. That's it. It's, so the, it's an official name. It's a very important piece of equipment, and um, it was our number one science <laughs> objective. And John and Drew are out there, and Mike and I are, are working a checklist. Megan's flying Drew around on the arm. Scooter's worried. And, and, and AJ's trying to keep him calm. So, we're, and, and Drew comes, pick it up. What's going on out there with, with that one? That was our first so, first counter. So this was, uh, so what, you, your question originally was what, what was wrong with Hubble? Well, one of which is that the instruments were old. And, Ray J mentioned the corrective optics, which is one part of it. The other was to put in a wide field camera. And this is the camera that makes the really iconic images and a lot of the science. And it was based on a, a camera, digital camera that you would get you know, back in 1993. Now, if you were to go to Walmart and try and buy a digital camera in 1993, they didn't exist. So this was pretty basic camera. Well, technology has marched on and now we can put in a super duper fantastic digital camera. And that's the new wide field camera three, unravel the mysteries of the universe. And <laughs> the thing I really loved about this, our very first task, is that it was the easiest task on the whole mission. I mean, there's a big bolt, and you unscrew the bolt, and you take the camera out, old camera, 
put the new camera in, screw down one big bolt, or actually two, but one primary one. What could go wrong? And, uh, and so you'll actually see it out there. There's something called a torque limiter. It's actually just a clutch that slips if you over torque it. And Drew went to undo the bolt, and the torque limiter started click, clicking, went click, 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 slipping. We the bolt was stuck. We didn't have any WD-40 either. To no. Spray it. And, you know, it's a telescope. You don't want to spray that stuff. And this, is his first, this is Drew's first <laughs> oh, Drew's, space walk. Right. Right. He's only been outside for a little bit. Right. In his so he case. fusses with it for a while, and so I go, okay, rookie error. You know, he probably doesn't have it engaged enough, and so I push it on because there's a, a special mechanism to keep it from turning that you have to push in enough to make it go. And I pushed in and turned and click, 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 click. So I, I actually wasn't worried at that point because we had another torque limiter at a higher torque. So I talked to Mass, and he said, go on, get it. And I scurry down the telescope and get the higher torque limit, put it on, think, OK, I can sit back now and watch Drew work. Click, 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 click. And now I'm really worried, because the folks who designed the Hubble were brilliant. They wanted to make sure that if this happened, uh, that when the clumsy astronaut would go to turn the bolt, if the torque was too high, that the bolt would break in a way to keep the old instrument in the telescope. Because if it broke so that the old instrument came out, you wouldn't get the new one in, because you'd have a piece of bolt stuck in the, in the threads. And then you'd have a big hole in the side of, of the Hubble, and Hubble wouldn't work anymore. And so I thought, you know, if Drew tries to do it any harder without protection, we're going to end up there. That was rule number and, two, uh, right? Don't, don't break, break the telescope. What was rule number three? You guys remember rule number three? I never even read Keep those Megan happy. Oh, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's not that's not fair, that? Megan. <laughs> Megan was stuck with six big <laughs> brothers, and that was rule number three. What? That's right. What, uh, first of all, people are listening to everything you say. Did you blaspheme? Did I? No, did John when the when the oh, bolt didn't when the bolt didn't go? Well, at that point, you know, I'm an astronomer, and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, this was absolutely the lowest point of my spaceflight career, so standing out there. Massimino, Mike, has this huge book, a little thin section, how to do the repairs, and then a big thick section, what to do when things go wrong. And he, you know, he had it open, I mean, I know yes. this, he had it open to the Wide Field Camera 3, Unravel the Mysteries of the Universe page, what to do if you can't get the old one out, and the first one says, try harder, you know, try with, <laughs> with the bolt. And then it, eventually it says, you know, just put the wrench on it and see if it breaks. And so that's what Drew did, and put it on, and. You know, I saw him pushing really hard, and then there was sort of you know, this release of tension, literally, in the bolt, and it spun a little bit. And I still wasn't happy because two things could have happened. Yeah, One, what I heard Drew say, as almost oh, a, he's yeah. got the thing on there, and he goes, oh, it broke. And I'm like, oh. That's right, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> it broke free. I'm like, oh. <laughs> but in fact, we didn't know. That's exactly and right. finally, when Drew put, yeah. put the power tool, pistol grip tool on there, pulled the trigger so it started spinning and I saw it moving out, you know, and then we could go back to normal ops. And you gave a woohoo, I think. Yeah, I did. I, 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 a yeah. I, said, the, I said about like this, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as excited as I get. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm glad you heard that. <laughs> I, I know all of you are called upon at times to talk about what you've done. And when people say to you, okay, what really are we getting from Hubble? What is it that is so spectacular about this? Why is it so important? What has it done for science? What do you say? Well, I'm, I'm not an astronomer, so my answer is not in the, in the technical um, area for astronomy, but one of the things that when we were first learning about the telescope, um, we, people came and gave us briefings about how wonderful the telescope was. And one of the things that really stuck with me was that the telescope was designed to answer specific questions about unlocking the mysteries of the universe. There were certain things that, that people wanted to know. But some of the biggest discoveries from the telescope are things that we didn't even, we weren't even smart enough to ask the question. And, and so for me at that level, that's what is so wonderful about the telescope is that it has extended our ability to explore the universe in a way that we weren't even smart enough to know about kind of before we did it. Well, so, I, I asked you, literally knowing you're not an astronomer, you have the, you're the astronaut, you're up there, you worked on it, but you have the layman's reaction of, of being able to explain what it is and how far back into, uh, into time, you can look with this thing. Yeah, I'm going to have to go over to John. John's going to going to have to give our answer for I'll, that. I'll one. try and be brief. <laughs> yeah, a but, brief history of time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is it's way like, before the Earth. Cooled. Catchy title for a book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want me to skip that part? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
to me, it's just really remarkable. And Hubble, the great observatory, is still a pretty small telescope, and it's orbiting Earth, 2.4 meters, you know, uh, big enough to pit, fit in the shuttle payload bay. But remarkably, you know, this telescope, the, the little telescope that could, has been able to observe, you know, all the way back to the, some of the very first galaxies in the universe after the Big Bang, you know, right to the limit of what we can actually see in visible light, uh, which is truly remarkable. There's no guarantee. The original spec for Hubble was to be able to see about halfway back. So the universe is about 13.5, actually 13.72 billion years old. And the whole universe has been expanding since then. And when it was created, it was just a big ball of hot gas. And galaxies, stars and galaxies formed out of that. And Hubble has been able to look back in time, because light takes a long time to travel to us, to see a galaxy that only 13.5 billion years old or something like you know, a few hundred million years after the creation of the universe. And then everything in between, how galaxies have organized themselves, how stars form in new galaxies, how planets form in stellar systems, even to the point with the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, which these two gentlemen repaired, to understand the atmosphere of a planet around nearby stars. You know, so many of these things that no one could have guessed when we launched the telescope. Uh, impacts of uh, asteroids on Jupiter proving the existence of black holes. And then something that, uh, in fact, resulted in, in the Nobel Prize in physics uh, after our flight. Uh, and uh, just Sunday, the breakthrough prize in, in physics, which is a, kind of like a Nobel Prize, the discovery of dark energy, which nobody knew about uh, prior to, to Hubble at all. It wasn't even on the radar screen. And this is some mysterious force causing the universe to accelerate its expansion. So just remarkable things that have totally changed not only astronomy, but physics. And that's not even talking about just how beautiful the universe is that Hubble has revealed for us. That's the thing I think that Hubble's done, is it put the universe on the wall of every science classroom uh, in schools all over the country, all over the world. I can't imagine there's a classroom like that that doesn't have a picture of a galaxy or the wide field uh, image of, you know, thousands of galaxies in one soda straw view of the night sky. And it's given us a perspective on our place in the universe that I don't think we had before then. How vast this is, you know, 1,500 galaxies in one soda straw view, billions of stars in each one, and you realize this is a big place and can't even understand it. Which leads me to a question that I've always wondered about. But you have a unique look at this because the science of this mission was so specific and was so overwhelming. What does it do to your faith? I'll just start. And uh, for me, it reinforces my faith. I mean, John talks about the Big Bang. And when I think about the Big Bang, I hear Genesis. And God said, let there be light. Boom! Mm -hmm. There it was. And. Uh, it's, I don't remember that word in Genesis, but I will, uh, <laughs> I've, forgot, I've forgotten which chapter of verse that's in. But it depends on the but, translation, yeah. you know. Yeah. Oh, I, I think it Genesis, it, the Scott Alton version. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I interrupted you. you, you were you're on, exactly you, right. You were I think uh, there's a lot of dynamics in there. Um, so, and the other piece I get from flying in space is looking back at the Earth. And John, uh, somebody mentioned, I think it was you, Mass, the thin... Uh, Point, the line, thin yeah. blue line around the planet. The first time I looked at it, I'm like, what the heck is that? And they, oh, that's the atmosphere. I'm like, what do you mean? It's only that thick. It's th thin compared to the size of the planet. I'm like, wow, that's all we have to keep us breathing and alive and r protect us from radiation? Who else wants to take the, the faith question? Yes? I think, you know, for, you know, for me, it, it, um, what Hubble shows us uh, Things, that, things eventually is science and what we believe. I think it all eventually, the more and more we learn, the create better understanding, I think it all kind of comes together. Um, but just some of the, I guess some of the uh, observations I, I thought of was that, um, all right, we're, we're going to like really talk about faith in God here, right? Is that what you're talking about, faith, sort of? <laughs> For me, like as a, as a father, if you think of God as a father and um, how we try to have nice things for our children, that if there's a if if you believe there is a creator, um, he gave us a really nice house, 
You know, we've got little Theo running around here, Megan, Megan's a little boy. You know, Megan, I know you make that house as nice as you can for him, right? You want to make his life perfect, right? And that's the way we feel about our children. Well, there, if there is someone up there looking out for us, they really do love us because they gave us a really nice house. And I know that there, nice probably is, there probably is somewhere, you know, you think about there's life other places, you know, there, there probably is, you know, we can, with all these billions of stars that Scooter yeah. mentioned, there probably is something else, something, but the thought that, and I know intellectually that means that, but when I, when I, when you see the earth as Mike described it, when you see it as a, as a planet there and, it, and you see how beautiful it is, you know, one of my thoughts was maybe there isn't anything quite like this. I can't imagine there being anything quite as beautiful as our planet. And some of the thoughts for me, again, were like, just to add on a little bit more, was if this, if you were in heaven, this is what you would see. And then it was replaced by another thought, which was, this is what heaven must look like. If you think of what paradise would be, I can't imagine it being any better than our planet. And so sometimes I think, Charlie, that Maybe this is as good as it gets. Because <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine a place any more beautiful than, than where we are right now. But you know, people in their minds wonder about conflict between science and faith and science yeah. and, 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 and belief and whether science in some way undercuts faith. And yet, when you see what you people have seen and when you take those pictures and when you talk about Earth in the way you did, um, and Mass, I think you put it really beautifully and I think you did, Scott, as well, it, it, it's an instance, it seems to me, where science reinforces faith. Yeah. Um, it's really an extraordinary um, event, and I think that's one of the things, at least to me, that came out of your mission and other missions like it. I remember, was it Frank Borman, um, when he was circling the Earth on, I think, Christmas Eve? Right. Yeah. And he quoted from they Genesis. Read from Genesis. And that was oh, one of the most moving things. I had a chance to thank him for that once, although I must tell you, I was anchoring the news that night, and this incredibly beautiful thing of Borman reading from Genesis as he looks back on Earth, and the damn guy in the control room rolled the wrong tape. <laughs> oh, really? And there was Senator Frank Pastore of Rhode Island griping about this and yelling about that. <laughs> Boy, did it kill the newscast. Luckily, it was in a small town, and, uh, and nobody, uh, uh, nobody took notice. W what do you worry about when you're wrangling a crew like this? Well, yeah, you're going to spend a lot of time together getting ready to fly the mission training. You want to get uh, make sure you do as good a job as you can, so you want to have a lot of talent. With talent sometimes comes egos, and you want to make sure everybody can live together for those years. Uh, I think we got a great group. Uh, as it worked out, we put a lot of talent together, and everybody tried to use that to the best of their abilities to make things work. The other thing um, is it's not just us up here. It's a huge cast of people on the ground, you know, folks who trained us, folks who supported us during the mission, the people who designed the instruments, the people who serviced the vehicles at Kennedy. You know, I, I used to say when we were on the flight deck up there, I had, felt like I had all those people along with me, and it was kind of crowded sometimes with the feeling that you had those thousands of people right there with you because you knew they had given their lives to this just like we were trying to as well. So it was quite an assembly of talent. That's why we like to get outside occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> In the spacesuit, go for a walk. But, I, I, but I'd like to follow up with that just a little bit, which is I think very common in the history of exploration that when you give people really challenging tasks, something that they believe in, that they feel is important, and I'm not just speaking about, you know, the seven of us on the crew, but, you know, the whole team uh, that Scooter referred to, uh, you know, that's part of the legacy of the Hubble Space Telescope program is that it was continually challenging very talented people, and that's when the really best traits of humanity come out because people working together can achieve things as a team, you know, that are, are just unbelievable. Uh, Ray J mentioned that we had lots of independent review teams watching over us and trying to make sure that we didn't do something that was unreasonable. And frequently they came back and said, you know, what we were trying to do, you know, was either impossible or a bridge too far. And we did all of those things and, and more. And I think that's you know, one of the, the legacies of Hubble is that it, it has you know, pushed people well beyond anything you know, that was imagined would be possible. 
It, it is kind of, I have, I'll tell a quick story about near the end of the mission, we have been working kind of hard. Some of the EVAs had gone long and we uh, shifted a couple of days and near the end they're saying, all right, you guys are working too hard. We're not gonna let you go long tomorrow. We're gonna have a short day. So uh, that's just the way it's gonna be. So we all got together and talked about that and we got up early the next morning and started running the EVA checklist. <laughs> The night shift was still yeah. on when we're like, okay, we're ready to go out the door. They're like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. So they, uh, they, the rule was we couldn't go long. We'd been going long on yeah. every EVA. So they're like, no more. You're going to have to end on time. So we thought, okay, we'll start early. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way that worked. So we got up early. I start running the checklist. I call down to the ground, and they're like, huh? <laughs> what? What do you? And we're not the EVA team. They yeah, come yeah. on in an hour. The, the shift yeah. hadn't arrived yet. That was supposed to do that, right? Yeah. So like Shannon Lucid, I think, was still answering right. the phone down there. Yeah. So we're, uh, you know, we're we're literally at the door, ready to to open it. Uh, and, and there's so. practical reasons that you can't go yeah. along, right? Well, this was yeah, th there yeah. were, yeah. I mean, but they, that. That had to do with landing, and, and that was Scooter's <laughs> problem. You know? well, After the last spacewalk, we were done. Yeah. <laughs> but it has to do with oxygen. It has right. to do with yes. uh, with yeah. power that you have in the suit. Yeah, the suit has a limited amount of time you can be right. outside. There's a limited amount of time you can be right. outside, and so you just went longer. Yeah, well, I think if the if the ground would actually have noticed, you you can tell if we're up because we use power. Uh, Lights turn on. Somebody uses the bathroom. The you can actually the toilet, know that. You can see that. Yeah. And so the if, they, if they had looked or they knew or, or they had heads up, they, they had the heads up. We had gotten sure, up early. Know. And I remember John had specifically said, I don't want to return those nobles, uh, the, the blankets on the outside, again, where I want to get up and I want to get this job done. And uh, I personally gave the mission about, and I'm pretty famous for giving things from zero to ten, a 70% chance of fully completing it all. And as we're getting towards the end, I go, hey, we're not going to complete it. We've got to stop or whatever. We gotta, they're going to cut us off. And then John came up with, you know, and Scooter, that, hey, we're just get up early. And I Jeez. go, I'm in. I'm all in. Let's, let's finish it. And yeah, so I, I don't, I, it, well, the, the, it, how, I don't think people realize how extraordinary to do five protracted spacewalks in five days with all you had to accomplish, just how extraordinary well, you, that really is. Your day is regimented, and you look at the setup of the day, you say, okay, I'm gonna give you three hours to get everything set up to go outside, six and a half hours outside, three hours to put everything uh, away after you come in and have it all set up for the next day. And you line, and then you, that leaves you eight hours of sleep. But then if your spacewalk goes, instead of six and a half hours, eight and a half hours, you're two hours into that, pushes you behind. Before you know it, you're working well into your sleep period, and now you're getting up at the same time the next morning, which is why they get worried about building up a fatigue de deficit. Megan, I, 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 I've been wrestling in my own mind with asking you this question. Um, Sorry, Because Megan. I, don't want to, I, don't want to, I don't want to appear sexist. But let me, let me go back in a story. I remember a day in the newsroom when Barbara Walters had done something really extraordinary that she didn't have to do. She could have sent out a lot of people to do it because she had all sorts of people to work for. But she went out and she did it herself, which was to do a stakeout to try to get an interview. Um, and Sam Donaldson said in a totally non-sexist way and with great admiration said, Barbara is one of the boys. And he meant that only in the nicest way. It might not be taken that way by some people. But after a while, when you're dealing with these guys, do they start to treat you like one of the boys, or do they pay deference? I think and I, I hope that they always treated me as one of the boys. From the beginning, um, I knew several of the crew members well. I knew Ray J well. Um, we'd flown together quite a bit in T-38, and I knew Bueno and, and Drew. We were classmates, and I knew Mass because we uh, shared an office together. And I knew Scooter and, and John less well. And right at the beginning of the mission, when, when I was first assigned, uh, Scooter called me into his office and he said, you know, I, I want to tell you that if you ever have a problem, you know, you are the only woman on this flight. If there's ever a problem or anything makes you uncomfortable, you can always come to me and talk to me about it. And, and, um, and I was really impressed by that and I felt very welcomed by that. And I said, well, the reverse is also true. If I ever do anything that makes you guys uncomfortable, you know, I hope, I hope you'll let me know as well. And one of the things that we do early on in the um, training is we go on a camping trip together. 
Not that. And this is a, um, it, it might seem like kind of a strange thing to do, but we spent about 10 days in the wilderness in Alaska together kayaking. Yeah. And really? um, we have a couple of uh, trainers, if you will, but they basically sort of have you navigate from point to point, which is something that most of us, other than John, hadn't done a lot of before. And you're, you know, you're backcountry camping, you know, in, in the wild. And so um, we take turns being leaders, and you uh, share it. You have a tent group, and you have a cook group, and so you're you're getting very um, uh, up close and personal with with your crewmates. And so um, you know you learn who snores pretty quickly. It turns out that, that I actually snore um, as, as well as my tent mates do. It's not only boys that snore, by the way. <laughs> so you, you know you have this you, yeah, you, you have this bonding that happens, and I think pretty early on you start to feel like a family, you know, you, you really do. And I don't think there was deference paid. I think we're all expected to do the work and given the um, respect that says, you, we know you can do this work um, and we're not going to dumb it down for you and make it easier for you because we know you can do your job. So yeah, I always felt that. When I talked to Mass the other day on the phone, I, and I'm violating a confidence here, um, he said, we don't talk about it much, but you can't overestimate the amount that we love each other, which is a tremendously... Uh, it's a tribute to all of you, I think. Uh, I, I knew you were going to make Bueno cry with you. <laughs> uh, but you do. You, when you are thrown together like that, where you are all so mutually dependent on the other person to do it just right, and the personalities have to mesh, yep. it's a, it's a, it, the pitfalls are numerous. But if you can really come together and bond as a group um, and depend on one another, that's a, that's a pretty extraordinary thing if you can do that with seven people. Um, you can't do that in a family most <laughs> times when the family is seven people. Um, one of the things that struck me, this was just 2009. It was just five years ago. But it seems like ancient history. And it does because the shuttle program is gone because the impetus in space exploration, even though we had today, which absolutely blows my mind, we had a lander on a comet 300 million miles away. Doesn't get much publicity. Um, the program is still, but it's not manned flight. And that's what captured everybody's imagination. First of all, John, you're still there. Uh, with, some of you are still there. Um, morale. How do people feel about what's happened with the program? Um, B, has the public lost its, its drive? Because I don't hear the political will to be going back. Um, and as somebody who I remember the first time Alan Shepard went up, and I thought, this is, God, how proud I was of the country, of the people who were doing this. Uh, it was extraordinary. Now you ask most kids, what was the space program? They don't know it. So tell me a little bit about morale, about how you all feel personally about what's happened and where we're going. I'll start with something that hasn't worked yet, but I keep trying, which is uh, I'm now in charge of the NASA science program. And we're doing incredible things. We were partners on the Rosetta landing uh, today. We landed the Curiosity on Mars just a couple of years ago. Curiosity is a rover. She has a Twitter account. She has a Facebook account. Um, but I've said this about Hubble. I say this about Curiosity. Uh, the Curiosity rover uh, will never discover anything on Mars. You know, it's people back on Earth that discover things. And so I don't see a black and white human spaceflight science. You know, it's, it's blended. You know, we, we do space flight to learn about the universe, to fix the Hubble, to live on the International Space Station, to do science, to extend our reach. And, you know, that aspect that science is exploration uh, and that if we could send people to Mars today from a budget, from a technology standpoint, we would. But the best we can do right now is this car-sized rover named Curiosity. And kids do know about Curiosity. They're engaged with Curiosity. It's robots in space. You know, when I was growing up, it was dinosaurs in space, now robots in space. And that's okay. Um, but we do have a very vital uh, space program with the International Space Station. We're developing the next vehicles, uh, the Orion vehicle, which will launch December, December first week 4th. of December. Yeah. Uh, it was stacked today on top of the Delta IV rocket. It's a, it's a test vehicle. Uh, the Space Launch System big rocket uh, to launch test flight later in the decade and then the next decade. Uh, and these are the exploration vehicles that will take us further. Um, but at the same time, we're building the 
James Webb Space Telescope, which is the Hubble 2.0, it's going to go where no Hubble has gone before. It's bigger. It can see deeper into the universe and with much more clarity. And so, you know, it's really a very integrated program, and, and we're pushing, you know, the boundaries uh, in all directions. Um, you know, the question of, you know, having a spectacular, you know, part of the space program, a John Glenn orbiting the Earth first time, uh, you know, Apollo 11 landing on the moon. You know, those are very episodic uh, and very exciting. Um, but that's been the nature of, of exploration forever. Uh, it's just now we live in a, in a Twitterverse, you know, where you have to have, you know, instant gratification. And it's hard for, uh, for a government on two, four, six, sometimes eight-year cycles uh, to keep things going where there's ownership. And it's hard for the American public to have, you know, a focus on things that take decades. As you're teaching kids at Columbia now, are they enthused about where we are, or are they discouraged? What, what, what are they, what's their feeling about it? Yeah. They are as the, 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 and I'm very fortunate. I'm no longer with the NASA officially, though you're always kind of a member of the family, but I'm now uh, full-time uh, teaching at, at Columbia, at engineering school there. And the students are just as excited as I think any of us were about the space program. They, they truly are, but it's, it's a bit different. Um, they see it not only as, a, as opportunities to maybe work with NASA, um, but they also see it as opportunities to work with these commercial companies. So I've had students in my, that took my class last semester, back in the spring, for example, over the summer, they had summer jobs. One had a summer job with Virgin Galactic. Um, one had a summer job with uh, SpaceX. Uh, one of them, someone who went to NASA at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, another one with Boeing, another one at Ames Research Center. So they are just as enthusiastic. They, there still is that interest in explore, exploring of maybe one day growing up to be an astronaut. Um, but I think in some ways it's, it's even more so because they see it as this entrepreneurial opportunity. It's Elon Musk, uh, Richard, Richard Branson, and so on, these, these entrepreneurs that are trying to make money and pave the way with, uh, with space travel. And do you think it could be successful? I mean, we all saw the... Branson uh, uh, test vehicle the other day, a crash, loss of one pilot. Um, do you see that the, that the private industry can, can do this, Scott? Well, I think that we are about at the point of finding out. And I, I'd like to believe that it can. The one thing that you find out is that flying in space is actually pretty hard. NASA's learned that lesson a few times. Uh, just like aviation, it's very unforgiving of those errors and assumptions that you make uh, where things can go wrong. If anything can go wrong, it will. That's uh, been true. And I think that's what happened in the Branson mishap with the deployment of the system at the wrong time. But, you know, you know in doing these things that they're going to be hard. And it kind of goes back to JFK when he talked about why are we going to go after and try and do these things. We're not going to do them just because they're easy. We're going to do them because they are hard, because it pushes ourselves to do better. And I think the commercial industry is finding that out, uh, but hopefully it will make them better. We're all moving forward. I think uh, it can be an exciting time. I take John's point about the science and about the importance of it, but I don't see the political will to follow this. Um, we all have our own opinions of the way the government's functioning right now, but, but you do worry that some of the things that are really can be exciting that uh, could be exciting, should be exciting, um, and pursuant uh, at, in full bore of man's desire to explore. Is the, the political will doesn't seem to be there anymore. Well, in, in my current job, I spend a lot of time at, in Congress and with the administration, uh, and I still, th I still find a lot of excitement about space exploration, about space science, earth science, uh, earth science less in some crowds. So give us but, the money to do it. But we have, exactly. we have very strong support in both houses of Congress, both parties. Uh, but these are really tough economic times. And I think the fact that NASA has as good of a budget as it does, being a discretionary activity in the federal government, you know, that is a specific definition. You know, the fact that we've maintained a nearly flat budget is actually pretty remarkable. You know, giving all, all of our troubles overseas, you know, and uh, you know, having, having our service men and women you know, around the globe uh, with you know, still recovering, you know, from an economic collapse of sorts. 
uh, that, that actually the strength of NASA and the fact that we have kept these programs in the International Space Station vital uh, and our international partnerships, the fact that our partners and the Russians for launch services, uh, the Europeans and the Japanese for cargo services, you know, is really a testament to how strong this is. So some of you are still in, some of you are now out. You want to go back, though? Would you go back in a minute? If I'd love to fly. Yeah, the flying. Every time we come back from a mission, they say, would you like to go again? And everybody puts their hand up. How about Tuesday? Yeah. <laughs> Ray J? Uh, same thing. It's, uh, it was really something that all the taxpayers out here who funded for us to go out and look into space and see so many more stars than you can see from the ground up there and you know we're at 306 nautical miles up so you can see just so much more you can see the southern cross i wish everybody could do it um yeah i, I go into space in a heartbeat and all those aches and pains that you have on the ground you don't <laughs> have in space <laughs> <laughs> and megan was a six month old would you would you go tomorrow <laughs> it, it is it is a different question now for sure i remember being in space during our mission and thinking you know, we, that I, I knew that I wanted to, to start a family when we got home, and um, I remember thinking, if this is it for me, if this is the only space flight I ever get, it's a pretty darn good one. You know, I feel really good about this, yeah. um, and, and that's okay. But, um, you know, getting to see the International Space Station, getting to see the next phase of, of development of a vehicle would be also very exciting as an astronaut. So um, I haven't quite made that decision yet. It's hard with a, with a little boy to, to say, okay, am I ready to leave? I'm not ready to leave him, you know, to go to the grocery store, so going to low Earth orbit is <laughs> a little bit daunting to think about. But, you know, in a couple of years' time, maybe, when he's two or three, you know, we'll drop yeah. him off at your house. And <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see. But certainly the excitement and the... And the um, passion for it is always going to be there. Bueno. Would I go again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know that I will, but uh, you know, as my wife uh, likes to remind me, you had a good run. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I so, hear the same yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 I think we all have. It's I think a conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Charlie, when you, we know when you talk about the political will, I think we as a country need to keep um, this dream of exploration alive. Great nations explore. And so we need to continue to do that. And it goes back to what Scooter was saying. You got a, a, a scientific instrument like Hubble that's really the first step of exploration. It allows us to look back into the universe to that first light 13 billion years ago. It allows us all to explore. Um, this is important. Great nations turn outward and, and they explore. You know, those nations that turn inward don't develop. Um, so we, we just need to keep pushing that. And I think th there's two sides to exploration. There's robotic and there's human. And they go together. But the human space flight um, is really the face of NASA. Okay? It's just that's the way it is. There's only a few of us that have had that privilege. I'm with Ray J. I wish everybody here could, could float in space. It turns out it's a lot of darn fun. <laughs> it, and it, it's this great experience, too, of looking back at the, uh, at the Earth. As I said earlier, you can tell it's a, it's a planet. Well, that may seem funny, but when you're standing on it, it doesn't look like a planet so much. But when you look at it, even from 300 miles up, and you look back at it, the incredible beauty of God's creation, and you realize it's a planet, guess what? This is our spaceship. We're all actually flying through space right now, this, on this spaceship. So we need to take care of it. It's our ship. You know, from, for these Navy guys, you know, you, what, you, you paint these darn things like once a year, no matter where they need it or not, right? <laughs> this is our spaceship. We need to take care of it, and we need to get along with the other people that are on this ship. When you're up there and you're going around the Earth once every 90 minutes, you know, you, you don't see the borders on those countries down there. So we all need to get along. It doesn't matter where you live, what language you speak. We all need to get along, and we need to take care of this, this, uh, this ship, because it's our spaceship. I used to love it when we would talk to, you mentioned the 90 minutes that it took to make a revolution of the Earth. I, I used to love, we would get, a, when we were able to interview the astronauts when they were in space, when I had the privilege of doing a number of times, you get a very precise amount of time. You had eight minutes or ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. And I used to love to start by saying, where are you now? And they'd go, we're over Hawaii. 
And then we'd finish the interview. Where are you now? This was eight minutes later or ten minutes later. Oh, there's Pittsburgh. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was just it was just amazing to, to do that. John, you're you're still in the program. You go, I suspect, tomorrow. I'm going, going a heartbeat. And you know, I, I live with now the unfortunate circumstance of knowing that the happiest I ever am is in space. I just I feel like I'm at home. Yeah. You know, I, I would live in space if I could. Mass? Yeah, I've had enough. <laughs> no, I, well, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. But uh, no, I, I, you know, sure. sure. I, I don't think I could ever. I mean, I'm not in the program anymore. So, but uh, but I think getting a chance to fly Hubble the first time was great, and I got to fly with Scooter and John and, and four other folks and uh, who, you know, a different crew. Uh, and I, I'm be, you can become part of the Hubble family. And a lot of the Hubble family is right there, right here, my friends. Raise your hands. You're right there. Right there they are in the front there. And being, being a part of that team was great. And then, but then you're kind of like a, you know, a hired hand, sort of. You know, you, you go and you, you go back into the pool, and you never know where you're gonna, right? You don't know where yeah. you're gonna end up again. They shuffle the deck. And I really was hoping uh, that I would get a chance to go to Hubble again because of these folks here and uh, getting to fly with John and Scooter again and then with, with the three, uh, three first-time flyers we had and, and Drew, who's not here, it was, it was extraordinary. And so it's, when, I'm, when I'm at Columbia, you know, I get the question, like, what, what do you miss the most about being an astronaut? And um, Cards, and oh. uh, if you want to pass them down to the end of the aisle, I'll ask a couple of the questions. We're going to have about 15 minutes to do that. If you've, if you've got some questions, I will uh, uh, ask hard. them. But I, right. I can't see the audience beyond the middle of the room because um, it's dark in here. But just, uh, I'm curious, how many of you would like to go? Just raise your hand. Hard to clap with a hand in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, can I just finish just in case? Yeah, I'll go again. <laughs> I would love to go again. Well, I cut to the, to the punchline is it was it was great. And the best thing about being an astronaut was the people you get to work with and the people you get to fly with. And uh, that's what I that's what I miss the most. And I, I I would love to go again. I don't know how that would happen, but I, in my mind I still believe somehow I'll get a chance. It may not be with NASA, who knows? But I, I still think that that's an important dream. It'll be like one of those movies where we're all really old and we're the only ones. <laughs> yeah, but you know the problem. You know the problem is like, <laughs> the problem is the end of the world. We are really old, except for you. That's the problem. <laughs> it's got to happen like in the next couple of weeks if they're going to make that movie. We're not <laughs> There's a couple of loose ends that we haven't talked. I know when, the, as I and I'm going back in memory, and this is somebody who can't remember what he had for breakfast, but. But uh, going back in memory, I, I remember that in 2009, the thought was that you were making Hubble, uh, that the minimum was that you were making Hubble operative through 2014. We're now in 2014. Hubble's still working. Mm -hmm. Do we know what its practical life is now as it stands? Well, yeah, yeah, just to be explicit, yeah. May of 2014 this year was when our warranty ran out. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, thought, we thought it would last much longer. It was the, it was the sell by date. It was yeah. You got to clarify that though, because the warranty was on the parts. On five the part, years. That's right. There was no warranty on the labor. Don't blame right? us. <laughs> <laughs> but is there now, John, a thought as to how long it, it, it can, uh, can be operative? Well, Hubble, there's a couple of angles on that, one of which is how long can it operate as an observatory? How long will the scientific instruments last? How long will the gyros last that these two gentlemen just put in uh, in 2009? And, and the gyros are very special uh, little machines with 70,000 RPM spinning parts. They do wear out. Uh, we've already had one, one set wear out. So you know, how long those last will determine how well we can point the observatory. The other is Hubble is slowly coming down, spiraling down into the atmosphere. And that depends on how active the sun is, something we can't control. So when we flew, we thought that by the early 2020s, Hubble would be too low in altitude to keep <laughs> observing. Um, but as many of you know, the sun has been extraordinarily quiet. And let's yes. keep it that way. <laughs> Don't disturb the sun. Uh, uh, and, and so the Earth's atmosphere hasn't really been swelled up, and Hubble is, is hanging up there pretty high. So there's some thought that the telescope itself will stay up until the 2030s. Uh, and as far as things are going now, we think we'll be able to observe into 2020, maybe beyond. So a lot of exciting science. So, you know, maybe we can come back for the, the uh, 30th anniversary. That would, that would be nice. And you mentioned the, the web uh, 
telescope that's going up. The height above Earth now of Hubble is? About 580 kilometers. 580 kilometers. See, I still like miles, so in the mid-300s. Yeah. All right, mid-300s of miles. And how high is the Webb telescope going to be? It's going to go a million miles Technically speaking, Earth. way out there. <laughs> really? Just under a million miles. A million. A million miles up. Yep. One million miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to look but, even teeny. <laughs> now, Hubble could see it. Yeah. We'll be able to see, sure, sure. And, but obviously not serviceable by any kind of a repair mission if anything <coughs> goes wrong. It has to work. So <coughs> the Hubble was an experiment, if you will, on how to build a telescope that can be fixed by astronauts in space. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is an experiment in building something as complex as Hubble, but it was designed, you know, so delicate that astronauts can't service it. And it doesn't have a grapple fixture. It doesn't have things to deploy oh, or you instruments got that to change put on, out. The grapple I fixture. tried. Oh, I tried. Okay. Uh, so it has to work. And, and actually, you mentioned the grapple. I don't know how you remember, but I remember reporting on it. When Skylab came back into the atmosphere, there was all sorts of concerns about would it land in the middle of Chicago? Yeah. Um, where was it going to come down? Could it uh, be damaging to, uh, to large numbers of humans? Uh, luckily, it, it, it came down in a rather benign fashion. But in this instance, this has been planned for. Right, Ray J, with, with, uh, uh, with Hubble. As a matter that, of fact, you yeah. took care of it on your trip. Um, they took care of it. But, um, yeah, we, it does have a we, we, we. The, the bigger we. Don't put um, the blame on us. He's worried about the warranty <laughs> thing. They took it. <laughs> they have, we have the ability to attach a robotic and grapple it and bring it through the, the atmosphere. And um, I'll let Seppi and his team do that. And there is a way. It will come down in the proper way. Um, and but not to be brought back to Earth, right? I was asking Masters, but to, to in effect burn up in a right way. So if we just to... randomly let it enter, we'll have the same problem. Now it's it only goes 28 and a half degrees north and south, so it's sort of equatorial Earth. But that turns out to be where a lot of people live, uh, and we we won't be able to predict where it goes. And so on this mission, we actually put a a fixture on the bottom of the telescope it's called the soft capture mechanism, but it's a capture fixture, so that sometime. Right now, we're looking at the late 2020s. We'll have to send up a, a rocket, unmanned rocket, to latch onto the bottom of Hubble so that at the end of its life, we can burn it and send it into the ocean. Because with that big, heavy glass mirror, it would survive to the surface and, and pose a risk to, potentially to people on Earth. Just a couple of questions from the audience. Um, Megan, I'm, let me take this one to you. What were the different steps you went through to become an astronaut? Uh, well, I went to, um, when I, I was a kid growing up, my dad was in the Navy pilot pilot, and uh, one of the military bases we lived on um, also shared space with the NASA training center. So I would see astronauts come there, um, you know, landing their T-38 jets on the ramp and coming in in their fancy blue suits. And I thought, well, that, that looks like a pretty fun job. But, but I knew that it was a, a long shot to ever get, uh, to get that kind of job. So I thought, well, I just want to work for NASA. I want to be part of that, something that's that special. Um, so I ended up studying aerospace engineering at UCLA. And uh, uh, then kind of in the course of, of school there, I got interested in ocean engineering um, during a, a student engineering project. But I always kind of kept in the back of my mind this idea that wouldn't it be fun to be an astronaut one day. And so as I neared towards the end of my um, graduate research, I, I just went and looked for what the application looked like, what kinds of people um, were hired by NASA to be astronauts. They're not just military, obviously. There's also civilians and scientists. And so I kind of just looked at what the steps were. You know, I, I, um, uh, you had, I had a science degree, so I already had that. I, I was uh, getting a PhD, so I, ha I had that. And uh, you know, people um, have flying backgrounds, and so I looked into learning how to fly, which was something that I wanted to do anyway, and, and got a private pilot's license. And I had a fair amount of experience doing operations that were not in aviation. They were more oceanography, you know, uh, shipboard deploying and recovering instruments, that kind of thing, scuba diving, doing a lot of work underwater. Um, so those were kinds of the kinds of um, experiences that I had that sort of parlayed into um, uh, similar experiences that astronauts would have. And so I just put my application in back when it was a paper application before, <laughs> before you submitted it on the web. And uh, I was still in graduate school at the time and got hired, uh, hired out of graduate school to come down in uh, 2000 and be part of the class with, with uh, Bueno and Drew. You, you operated, you mentioned at the beginning, you operated the robotic arm on the plane. You brought Skylab into the payload bay. You, it's a very tricky job. Did you ever utter in the entire mission the word oops? <laughs> 
<laughs> not during the mission, no. You do want to do all of your oopses before you leave yeah. the planet, pretty much. Um, but, to, I, well, I take that back, actually. There was the, the mechanism uh, inside the robotic arm, the grapple mechanism. After you've released the, uh, whatever it is you've grappled, um, you have to let the mechanism run uh, until it's back into its open position. But you're not supposed to let it run for too long because it could potentially burn the motor out. So I was very preoccupied with um, not hitting the telescope as I backed away. Um, being very careful about that, and also wanting to remember to turn this uh, motor off before it, before it burned out. So I turned the motor off too early, which if you're going to have an oops, is probably the right side of oops to, <laughs> to me on that. And it's funny how bad you feel about those kinds of mistakes. I mean, you really, you really feel bad, you know, and, and the robotics team are like, hey, that's, you know, it's no big deal, but you feel, you feel like, oh, I made a mistake. That's terrible. But, um, Bridget, what steps do you go through? Um, you know, I I'm, if we have students in the audience, you probably ought not to listen to this. So um, I sought out in my entire career fun, essentially. And uh, so when it, you know, I, I really liked science and technology. I really liked sitting next to John and talking about um, science through the whole almost three years of training. But um, I, I became an aeronautical engineer and then I got bit by the flying bug, so I started to fly, and then I said, well, well, this is a lot of fun. What would be fun? Oh, it would be fun to fly off carriers, so I did that. And then I saw some uh, test footage, and I said, well, it would be fun to be a test pilot, and I did that. And then, the next, then I was running out of fun in the aviation realm, and it was astronaut was the last thing to do. <laughs> so normally they ask you, well, when did you want to be an astronaut? And, you know, I would say Megan probably coming out of the womb or something <laughs> that, four years old. For me, it really didn't become a reality until I was about 20, and that is the wrong answer. So how you become an astronaut is you apply, and you apply, <laughs> and then you apply again, and then they eventually select you. So that was really it. I, I enjoy machines. I enjoy controlling things. Um, and. It just was a natural progression of where I was trying to go. That's an important component, though, that you mentioned when we were talking about the bonding of the crew. I think it was you who said to me earlier that you and Mass decided we're going to make this fun. And we're going to find ways to make this <laughs> to make fun, this as fun. arduous as it is, as difficult as it is, as taxing as all of the days are going to be. We're going to find time to make it fun. Well, okay, I got to interject here on that note. Take us back to orbit. We've just finished five straight spacewalks. We took us ourselves to the edge of killing Hubble, and we didn't. We got through it. We did all the objectives. We deploy Hubble perfectly, maybe one extra switch throw. But as far as I can tell, perfectly. Now the spacewalkers are all rejoicing, and they want to party and have fun. I'm like, hey, I got to land this thing. <laughs> My job's not over. Yeah, there was so some they actually beamed up the movie Star Trek, the new Star Trek that came out. Mm -hmm. and we were watching it in increments, and it's the night before entry, landing, and uh, we're, we're finally watching like the last part of it, but there's like a half an hour to go, and it's time for lights out. So I'm looking, like, all right, everybody, time to shut down. <laughs> they look at me like, Oh, come on, Dad, I want to watch the rest of the show. I'm like, well, all right, I'm not going to be able to sleep anyway. <laughs> Keep it rolling. And just to finish the last question, and then, and then I know, John, you've got a film that you want to, that you want to show a little bit of. Um, but it's a futuristic question. It's a science fiction question, I guess, really. Um, space colonization. Is it going to be, do you think, practical someday? Mike? <coughs> Yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, I think we need to find a, a backup to Earth. <laughs> In effect, yeah. um, whether it's on the Moon or Mars or somewhere else out there, you know. So part of it's that exploration piece of finding out what else is out there, but there's a practical piece too of uh, just having um, another place to go. Um, you know, I'm not. Uh, all that worried about it, in, you know, this week or in my lifetime. But uh, you know, there's a there's a bunch of stuff flying around out there in space, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a non-zero chance that some some rock or some piece could uh, hit hit some part of the Earth here, or um, you know. So we don't want to be we don't want to be like the dinosaurs. We ought to try to learn something from those guys. All right, uh, John, what what do you got to show us? So this is. Uh tonight an event, and hopefully you all go through the exhibit. But we are getting ready to celebrate Hubble's 25th birthday, which for a spacecraft 
uh, of any kind is, is truly remarkable, but for Hubble uh, is something that goes well and beyond, that's part of our culture. I think that's why folks were so upset when the Hubble mission was canceled, is you know, you're taking away something that's near and dear to Americans' heart, to everybody's heart, it's the People's Telescope. And so we're just preparing uh, the Hubble 25th birthday celebration. And so we put together a 30 second video, kind of as a teaser, uh, to what we'll see in the next year from NASA, from the Space Telescope Science Institute that runs the Hubble, from the scientific community, and really from everybody. We want to use this celebration uh, as a chance to celebrate science, to celebrate the people and the mission. And so we've got a 30 second video to roll up. Great, let's take a look. I just want to conclude, first of all, thanking all of you for coming, thanking the six of you. I know reunions are special for you guys, but to do this and to have a chance to talk to you is a great treat for me. I had a great job for a number of years. and I remember talking to a newspaper reporter once and saying, they said, how much do you love your job? I said, I think I've got one of the five or six best jobs on earth, on earth. <laughs> <laughs> These guys trumped me on the on earth part and a job that I envy you so. And I, I think every time I get a chance to meet people who come out of, your, uh, out of your classes who have been able to serve as astronauts, when I meet people who have been working down on the ground to support you as well, it is a treat. You are some of the best that America produces. And I thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks. <laughs>